Um, I'm very pleased to be joined today by these three uh, gentlemen who are really going to help us to dig into this issue set, and we have plenty of time here this morning to both to have a discussion among the panelists, but also to, to talk to all of you with your questions as we go forward. The purpose of this panel really is to be thinking about what is the legacy of the last 13 years of war? What have we learned for good or for ill about the state of U.S. civil military relations? Uh, many people in the audience, of course, will know that we have many fewer uh, people in our population who have served in the military than have past generations coming out of war. We also have a historically low number of members of Congress or participants in the administration who are, uh, have been served in the military, although we have had with this recent midterm a, a new wave of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans who are joining the Congress. Uh, and so what we want to talk about here today is what are the effects on society of these shifts in our military population, and is there a growing divide between society at large and the military? And then at the highest levels of power and senior leadership, is there uh, a, tr a level of trust um, and a, a positive relationship that's in keeping with our Constitution uh, for civilians and military going forward. So to help me dig into these issues here, I brought together this panel we have here today. To my immediate uh, right is Colonel Rich Lockmont, retired. Uh, he's the dean of the Strategic Land Power School at the Army War College. He has taught at West Point, he has taught at the Naval War College, and he um, is a principal educator for current military members uh, on issues such as civil military relations. He also has a PhD from Princeton University. Uh, immediately to his right is Elliot Cohen, uh, who is the Osgood Professor of Strategic Studies at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, right around the corner from us here. Um, Dr. Cohen is, uh, has also served as the counselor of the Department of State in the Bush administration. Um, and he has served prior at times inside government as well on the civilian side. And, and notably, he's also written extensively on civil military relations um, from his academic background. And then all the way to my right, we have Mark Perry, who is an author and a journalist. He, among the books he has written, is The Most Dangerous Man in America and Partners in Command, both of which re, uh, relate to the subject of civil military relations. And he currently is a military intelligence and foreign affairs analyst um, whose writing you can see in such publications as foreign policy and uh, routinely, frankly, writing on issues re that touch on civil military relations um, inside the United States. So I want to thank all three of you for coming today. Um, and let's just get started. Um, maybe we start mostly with Rich and get your first take on what you think has been most notable and striking from your experiences um, educating the population of Iraq and Afghanistan participants and veterans today. What has been most striking from your perspective about what has happened over the last 13 years with regard to civil military relations? Well, thanks. Thanks very much uh, for letting me be here. By the way, first off, I wanted to say, uh, no, two things I have to say. First, my disclaimer, as a <laughs> member of the, uh, the U.S. military establishment that uh, I'm speaking here in my personal capacity and my Views do not aren't the official views of the Army or the Army War College. Secondly, for those of you who looked at the program and saw Brigadier General Tom Cosentino as the person to be here, I'm taking his place. He sends his regret, regrets and his regard. So, uh, but I'm very pleased to be here. Now, we we've had a lot of he and I, amongst many others, have discussed some of these topics. Uh, I'll start by you know I, I tried to think hard about this idea of kind of how to characterize the last 13 years of civil military relations, and, and I'll go back just a little bit further. So when I was a captain in the mid-90s, early to mid-90s, there was a literature out there. It actually started with kind of a, it was called a crisis in civil military relations, question mark, a headline, put on an article by Dick Cohn, which suggested potential problems. And so in 19, I think it was like 93 that that article came out, just as I was entering graduate school. And so I sort of took that as a, uh, as a hypothesis. Is there a crisis? Uh, as, and over the years now, I've had a chance, it's now been some 20, 21 years, and I look at what's happened, particularly with the wars uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and my sense is that crisis never transpired. Uh, there are certainly tensions in civil military relations, but I would submit that there are bound to be. And if there aren't, that's probably more problematic uh, than you know, pure harmony, if you will. So a lot of the tensions are the natural part of 
military leaders with a body of expert professional knowledge, abstract knowledge, applied to particular jurisdictions that they, that they operate in on behalf of society. So that's what a profession does. And that's, that operation within a jurisdiction of practice with that body of knowledge is something you constantly negotiate with those you serve. That's the American public more broadly, particularly the civilian leaders, both the executive and in the legislative branches. And that's a complicated, these are really important issues that are very difficult to deal with. And my sense, if I had to sort of up or down on the entire period, is that actually civil military relations have been pretty healthy. That we have military leaders who have behaved appropriately. We may not, I mean, there are there some blips that hit the, hit, the, hit the press, but on balance, they performed their, their role well, that civilians have demanded of them that they deal with these issues and try to uh, you know, connect the use of military means to these different policy aims. And that leads to tensions. There are clearly differences of opinion and judgment about how best that's to be done. But the best way to hash those out is through debate about those disagreements. Preferably, I mean, there's, there are different mm -hmm. mechanisms in private or sometimes in congressional testimony is required by some of the senior leaders. But on balance, I think that's been done very well. So I look at it and say, it's a constant education process for the military leaders, especially the, the, soldier, or the leaders that I deal with, uh, senior service college, students transitioning from kind of the tactical realm into the strategic leadership realm to get them to understand what it means to operate in that environment. And that's a continuous challenge to, to engage those rising leaders. So that's always there. But on balance, I think we've, we've identified what the right topics are. We've identified those things that change. And we work pretty diligently at that. I think we've done pretty well. If I look back over the last 13 years, I think there were areas early on uh, where we, there were some deficiencies that have been improved. Uh, and I'll leave it at that for now so I don't go on. We may come back to yeah. some of the details. On balance, pretty healthy. Elliot, do you share that view that it it, it's been better than we may have expected it to be? Um, yeah. Um, I agree with pretty much everything that Rich said. Um, I would add a couple points. First, I think actually the crisis literature I think was quite useful mm -hmm. because it caused people to reflect on civil military relations um, in ways that were, I, I believe, were ultimately productive. So that, you know, for example, issues like retired general officers getting in the business of endorsing uh, political candidates, candidates for president. That began to be surfaced as an issue that maybe there, there's something problematic about that. And I think people are a little bit more restrained about that sort of thing. Um, I completely agree that a certain amount of tension is not only inevitable, but probably desirable. Um, I really do think that. The, the perspective of very senior military people and very senior political people should be different, has to be different, always has been different. And that's, again, I think I tend to believe that that's um, that's really a healthy thing. I, specifically, though, I would, I would say there are uh, two things that have happened in the last 13 years of war. You know, in the 1990s, the last conflict that we had had was the Gulf War, the last real war. And that created unrealistic expectations, I think, both within the United States military and to some extent in a It'll pass. Uh, in a broader... Uh, <laughs> in the broader population about what civil military relations or indeed the conduct of war could be. And I think, you know, frankly, there were enough screw ups on both sides so that everybody's a lot more sober now about what to expect. And the military's on a bit less of a pedestal. Um, and the civilians are, are more sober as well. So I, I think this is actually kind of a positive effect from the last, um, the last 13 years of war. The, the other thing is, although, Kathy, I take your point about uh, it's a smaller portion of the population mm -hmm. that served. It's in absolute terms, it's a large number of people. Mm -hmm. You know, we're probably talking about something like at least a million veterans mm -hmm. who, one way or another, have passed through mm -hmm. Iraq and Afghanistan. Those people all have families, they have friends. Um, I think, I, I suspect, I don't know, but I, I believe if somebody dug into the data, you'd see there's actually more elite participation in the military than in the 1990s. I mean, I just know from, you know, my own family, friends, there are a lot more kids who are going to elite institutions who are also going into military yes. service. Um, there are a lot of young veterans getting out. You know, Rich is dealing with veterans. Well, you know, across the street here, my students tend to be in their mid to late 20s. Classes are now filled with young captains and majors getting out of the service. 
Um, they're going to go on, some of them into government, some into the private sector. That's going to be a very healthy thing. There's a whole generation of young civilians who worked with them in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and state or USAID or non-governmental organizations, you know, who've had a lot of experience now in dealing with the military. So I'm actually kind of optimistic. Yeah, we're going to come back to the data because you're right on several of these points. But let's just continue on and let Mark have a shot at this open-ended question. What do you think the legacy of the last 13 years has been? Has it been better than, than we could have hoped? Uh, are there areas of concern? Uh, I agree that it's, we're not facing a crisis in civil-military relations. I agree. But um, I think that there are three deep challenges that we face, and it's no use papering over them. Uh, two of those challenges predate 9-11. And the first is how and when we fight wars, and more importantly, whether we fight wars. And that dates from the end of World War II, which left the United States as the dominant military power but a nation that acted with restraints, with restraint, but that there were deep questions about the deployment in Korea. We all know the Vietnam crisis in civil military relations, which were quite deep. And, and, and this how, when, and whether to fight a war resurfaced, uh, not in Gulf War I, but in Gulf War II, and in its immediate aftermath when Colin Powell said, uh, if you break the China, we own it. Well, we left Iraq, we broke the China, we left Iraq, and we didn't own it, and now we have to go back in and own the China. It's a problem. The second challenge that we face is who does reconstruction? Who does effective civil affairs in post-conflict countries? And there was a quiet but important debate about this when Secretary Gates was Secretary of Defense, when we ran a business transaction and transformation policy in Iraq, and it wasn't the job of the Pentagon to do it, it was the State Department's job to do it. And the problem with having the State Department doing it, according to military officers, is they can't do it. So there's now tension between the military and the State Department, between military officers and the State Department. Just go listen to some colonels talk about some, uh, State Department capabilities in post-conflict situations. And we have to straighten that out. Uh, President Bush came up with a piece of legislation to create a civilian reserve corps. And we need to do that. We need to start training diplomats and foreign policy officers to go in and focus on reconstruction. Reconstruction in Iraq during the Anbar Awakening was run by civil affairs groups of the Marine Corps, and it's not their job. It's a waste of resources. And the third thing, the third challenge we face is that while there's not a seven days in May scenario out there, uh, for those of you, I just dated myself, but you know, we're not, the military isn't going to undermine civilian control of our force. It's, it's not ever going to happen. They don't want to have that kind of political power. They don't, they shun it. But we need to listen a lot more closely to opinions from military officers about the kinds of conflicts we're waging, and we haven't been doing it. Eric Shinseki was sidelined and marginalized for saying the right thing on Gulf War II, which was we didn't have enough troops. And William Wallace was sidelined and marginalized by the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time for saying, we never gamed this conflict. When what should have happened is the president should have said, bring that guy in here, let's find out what's going on, let's solve the problem. We need to do more of that. Wearing a uniform is not a disqualifier for freedom of speech. So Elliot, this is an area that you've uh, studied a lot, written a lot on. I'd love to get your take on this issue of what, you know, what is the role of the active military in terms of their voice in the system and you know, I, I also where one it. starts and ends. And you lived for, it from the State yeah, Department lived, side well, too I lived on this reconstruction. I for two years as a member of the uh, Deputies Committee. Yeah. And I assure you the military is not muzzled. 
You know, you'll hear plenty, actually you'll hear plenty from the J3 and the J5 about what they think American foreign policy ought to be. They're not particularly interested in hearing from the State Department about what military policy ought to be. So it's, um, I, I, I just, I don't really don't think that's true. I think, you know, in any administration you're gonna have a cocktail of personalities. But, but the fact is, you know, the engine of our, you know, the way decisions are made are that deputies committee. By and large, Everybody around the table gets some sort of uh, gets some sort of voice. What's not appropriate, I think, um, is, I, I do think you give up freedom of speech. Uh, actually, if you go into the government as any kind of official, you give up some freedom of speech. As counselor, I did not have freedom of speech. I wasn't going to criticize those aspects of Bush administration foreign policy with which I disagreed, and there were a bunch. And I was not going to say anything publicly about it. Uh, nor should, and I should have been fired if I did. Um, I think you, you give up some of that. The, the, the critical thing, I think, for civilian leadership is you, to, to sound out the military, no question about it. But uh, at the end of the day, policy making is a civilian, it's a civilian function. And you know, good leaders sound out their advisors, both civilian and military, and then make a decision. And I do think you know, it's important, I, I make two other points. One, it's important to distinguish between healthy civil military relations and sound policy. We may or may not think the Iraq war was a, the wrong war to fight. That really doesn't have anything to do in, per se with civil military relations. That's a very different, uh, that's a very different matter. You know, it's much more when you get into the conduct, I think, when, I think when you get into the conduct of war. The other point is I really disagree about um, having spent two years in the State Department after having spent my, most of my career when I was in and out of government in the Defense Department, but I can tell you the State Department will not be able to do reconstruction. They just can't. Uh, and it, you know you can complain about it as long as you like, but you know we don't have diplomats running cities in the United States. So why on earth do you think they can run cities in a war-torn country? Now, to the extent that we do that sort of thing, it's going to be kind of the way we did it in World War II with civil affairs units, probably some of them filled with you know, people who are city managers and uh, their normal lives and that sort of thing. Uh, there's a, I think there's an interesting question about how much reconstruction work we should do. I, it seems to be one of the lessons of um, Iraq and Afghanistan is we should be a lot more modest in our expectations of how much of that kind of work can usefully be done. But, but you know, for as long as I've been around, I've heard people, you know, military friends of mine complain about the State Department without really having a clue about its capabilities, which are very limited and which are intrinsically limited because we don't train foreign service officers normally and we can't really, you know, to go run war-torn countries. That's just not yeah. what they're going to do. And, and military officers can complain about it, and they do, but they won't change anything. So they got to get on with the task. Um, Rick, let me first ask if one of the staff can shut. There's a door that swung open over here. Um, and uh, Rich, give me your sense from talking to active duty mm -hmm. folks. Where where are they finding the the problems drawing the line, or are they finding problems mm -hmm. drawing this line between providing advice and um, overstepping, if you will, their role? What what do you think is most frustrating um, to them and their responsibilities? Uh, well, if I may, I'm just gonna I'm gonna play off of sure, what Ellie was just talking about. This thing about reconstruction. I think we spend a lot of time, and I'll go back yeah. to my point because that was one of the specifics I kind of was in the background when yep. I said there were some tensions early on when we got into Iraq and Afghanistan. I think a part of that, and this is one where I tend to place more of the uh, of the negative judgment on the military side, is that coming going after 9/11, uh, partly coming out of uh, some of the lessons of the Gulf War, there was a sense of you know, focused on conventional combat operations as really the only thing the military had to be able to do. And so caught in situations in both Afghanistan and Iraq where the aftermath required a significant military presence for all the right reasons that has been there throughout most of America's wars. And by the military, I mean predominantly the U.S. Army has been kind of your post-conflict stability force, whether the occupation force, uh, whether just ma meeting basic humanitarian needs of the areas that we've taken under control. I mean, that's one of those things that, you know, the law of war and human decency require us to behave in ways that are mindful of the populations in the areas we take control of. I think the military had written that out of its portfolio in a fairly dramatic way, such that it was surprised. Some of the, 
uh, some of the comments, you know, I think General Wallace had another one of those where he said he looked out at uh, Baghdad and saw the looting and said, somebody should take care of that, uh, or something to that effect. And then realized, wait a second, that somebody is me. Uh, we are the force on the ground. And so it took a while for the military to sort of acknowledge that those sorts of support to, to what happens after the war and some significant contributions in doing things that are not the first, second, or third priority for the military, but are things we can do with military forces, and that they were necessary in those circumstances, and realizing that that was a jurisdiction of practice that the military had chose not to focus on in a way that I would submit was inappropriate. Now, could there be, was there more that civilians could do? Sure, I can think of many ways, but for the State Department, at best, they're going to provide advice. Same thing for USAID, just the magnitude of those organizations. Uh, you said you know, it, you know, there, there's probably, I think, 25,000 total between USAID and the State Department at the time, and there's over 3 million people in the U.S. Department of Defense. If you think of this in terms of inboxes of, okay, we have this one organization, and, and the inboxes may look the same because you can put a title on them, mm -hmm. but what was behind those, what was what they can handle, the operational capacity is completely different. Only the military, or the military has an extraordinary operational capacity that can be brought to bear and has been brought to bear routinely throughout U.S. history. Uh, and the State Department and USAID have very limited operational capacity. But we're all responsible for helping the United States achieve its policy aims. And so figuring out what those organizations are going to do, I think was something that took a little while for the military to sort of recognize that again and decide, oh, yes, you're right, this is part of it. And by 2004 or 5, saw that adjustment, saw the Department of Defense and actually the office I worked in, in the Office of Secretary of Defense was the Stability Operations Office, where they promulgated a policy saying combat operations, stability operations should be on par. And that was a recognition of kind of going back to our roots, not something new, but something of recapturing something of our roots. And so that was an important tension that I think gets at some of the points brought up with Mark and Elliot. Uh, now, your question was, was a little bit <laughs> well, different, though. Well, I, I do want to pursue me. this issue on reconstruction and mission mm. growth, but I, let, me, let me get first through this question mm. of how, this sense of where does the line end right. for advice, um, military advice, and where, you know, where is the sense and the force today from folks you're talking mm. to about the fr any frustrations? Do they feel that they understand that line very mm. well? Um, do they have frustrations about the way their role is interpreted, or is there confusion over kind of where that line is? What's your sense in talking to folks? It, you know, that's one where I, I think that line is always kind of tough. One, mm -hmm. I don't think they're, you know, if, if you know, I'll go back to another sort of academic thing. The, you know, Samuel Huntington is and his way of sort of trying to create a clearer line between the sort of civilian and military realm, objective control of the military. I think that was theoretically, analytically, mm -hmm. um, maybe not a bad thing to, to stipulate, but in reality, it's just it's too blurry a line. And so there's a constant you know, effort mm -hmm. to try to figure out where that line is. And that's going to be with any group of military leaders, any group of civilians trying to decide how best do we accomplish what the nation wants done. So in that regard, it's always a tension, and it's always kind of a learning effort for the military folks. Uh, frustrations, uh, again, it probably, it's hard without a specific issue. Well, do you think, for instance, that the frustrations were mostly around policy decisions, back to Elliot's point, about whether to go to war, when to go to war, how yeah. to go to war, or, um, do, or, or do you think they were more operational and tactical in terms of concern about, yeah. you know, the, the you know, 2,000 mile screwdriver kind of issues? The, the tensions I've actually witnessed were more about the, you know, the operational part. Yeah. And I think even what I described with sort of the stability operations and counterinsurgency issues were that, that dissonance between what mm -hmm. the military thought it should be doing and it argued its position mm -hmm. to say, hey, this looks like it should be the State Department. We went through mm -hmm. a lot of those arguments. Could, could I point yeah. out, you know, the frustrations go in both directions. Yes. So uh, let me give you just one example from my own tenure as, uh, at, at the Department of State. Um, basically, you know, the secretary had me working on Iraq and Afghanistan pretty much full time uh, with some excursions. So my first trip to Afghanistan, you know, what struck me is we're fighting seven different wars. Okay, there's, you know, American conventional forces. <coughs> There are so-called white special for operations forces, which are doing fighting their own war. There's black special operations forces. They're fighting their war. There's the folks who are training the Afghan army. They're conducting operations. CIA is fighting its war. The uh, Afghan service is fighting its war. You know, you go NATO fighting a different war. And you know, when you asked 
I came back and asked military friends of mine, whatever happened to the unity of command thing that I kept on hearing so much about when I taught at the Naval War College with my friend Richard Ackman? It was kind of outrageous that I would ask the question. And I would submit that one of the biggest problems with, with the Bush administration was a failure to ask those kinds of questions. And you know, gradually, that particular issue got fixed. But the civilians tend to be extraordinarily deferential, even about asking questions about those sorts of things. Mm. So, and and I, I, I push back a bit at the idea that the only issue is whether the military is frustrated. As you well know, anybody in government is frustrated. <laughs> that's, that's what the business of government is. It's frustration. But, but it's not the only issue. I think that's an excellent point. So let's, let's come at that civilian side of it. Um, and and um, Mark, you're, you're talking routinely to folks today about issues relating to, for instance, the fight against ISIS. What is your sense of the state of the, the trust and the um, issues coming from the civilian side, the White House, maybe from the State Department and the civilians in DOD and the military? I don't think it's a secret, I hope it's not a secret, that there is tension between the President of the United States and senior military officers right now. And we can't dodge that. Uh, there are good, good reasons for it. I think there was a disagreement between President Obama and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mike Mullen, over the correct number of troops and what to do in Afghanistan, and they worked that problem out, but it tended to sour, I think, uh, the current environment. Uh, if, I, if I can go back just a minute sure. to kind of defend myself. Um, <laughs> there was under the Gates Pentagon a, a, um, an operation which was quite effective in the reconstruction of Iraq, and it was called the Task Force for Business and Stability Operations. It was really good. It worked. Uh, it was headed up by a civilian, and it went into Iraq, and it the man went into Iraq and told Mr. Bremer that the goal was not to create a free market economy necessarily, but even if these Saddam businesses had been government owned, we ought to get them up and running and employ 19 to 35 year olds so they don't have to pick up weapons. And he did a job. He did a great job. That office did a great job. It did a great job in Afghanistan and then Gates ended it. And it, Gates ended it because he didn't have the statutory, the Pentagon did not have the statutory responsibility to do it. And it was never picked up. And the 19 to 35 year olds in Anbar went back out on the streets and this time instead of going to Al Qaeda they went to ISIS. Now obviously I'm simplifying to make my point but I think it's a salient point. There isn't now in our government well, it's not the State Department's job. Well, it's certainly not the Pentagon's job, but it has to be somebody's job. And somebody's got to do stability and economic operations in post-conflict countries so that we can own the China we break, or we're going to have to go back and re-break the China, which is what we're doing now, and not very well, by the way. And I think to my colleague's point on more general civil military um, Tensions, we can, you know, there are personalities here. We can get past the McChrystal, you know, should he have talked to a, a Rolling Stone journalist. I think that these kinds of things happen in every generation of military civilian, and we, and we can get through them. But the question is whether the civilian policy leadership in this country is correctly defining the threats we face and what kind of force we ought to apply to solve those threats. If ISIS is a threat... To our national security, 25 sorties a day of fighter pilots isn't going to solve that. And it used to be in this country that the, that the civilian leadership very clearly said what the military's role was and what the doctrine of the United States was. And the doctrine was basically this from Fox Connor in World War I, which military officers now recite. Don't fight unless you have to. 
don't fight for long and don't fight alone. And I would add the Weinberg Doctrine, go in with overwhelming force and get it done. We've gotten away from that and it's causing us problems. And that definition of the national interest and how we use the military needs to be reasserted or be rewritten. And it's the civilian leader's job to do it, and they haven't been doing it. Let me ask a question. All of you have obviously touched on, talked about this issue of reconstruction, and it is probably the most prominent element, sort of new growth element, yeah. unfortunately new growth. We wish we had, hadn't have had to regrow it um, in the past 13 years because of the decline in those skill sets following Vietnam. Um, th there is obviously this tension between what is it that the military should be doing. Ebola is probably the most recent example. What is it that the military should be doing inside uh, the U.S. system, and what should others do? And Elliot makes the strong point that the military, and as do you, Rich, that the military is simply size, scaled, operational in nature, able to take, you know, able to leap small, you know, tall buildings in a single bound, where other agencies aren't designed that way. My question, I'm just going to try to bring us back to civil military relations, is what is, the, what is the risk that that presents if we continue to expand the mission set for the military and continue to empower it, size it, equip it to deal with an ever-expanding set of issues and, and essentially allow atrophy on the civilian side? So I'm asking that in a very leading way. Obviously, I have an opinion on that matter. Um, but I take Elliot's point that maybe there's nothing you can do about that. So let me ask first Rich mm -hmm. and then Elliot in particular to comment. Do you, how do you, where do you square that circle? You, you know, we, we always, in crisis, go to the military, but we seem to never be able to transition effectively over time to build civilian capacity. Are we just stuck with that, or is there a way out? Well, let me... Uh Make two points. I'll, I'll start with kind of a domestic analogy. I mean, we, there's at a far end, you know, there are, you know, looking at the priorities of missions you use the military for, there's kind of the unique one of, you know, organized combat against a state foe. There's nobody else in the U.S. Mil or the government who is prepared to execute that mission. The U.S. military must be prepared to handle that mission. Nobody else can do that one. At the far end are sort of a lot of things that just require a body of disciplined labor. Uh, and I'll use a domestic example of fighting forest fires or dealing sure. with flood. We routinely invoke the military to do that. There's nothing unique about the military's ability to handle floods or fires. Uh, but what we have is a very large uh, disciplined labor force that can be employed to do some of the key tasks. Now, and I'll continue that domestic, domestic allergy just a little bit. When we fight forest fires with military forces, we usually have firefighters advise them on how best to do that. So we take the limited capacity of those who really do have the expertise to help guide the military, our discipline labor, to take care of some of the more simple tasks that can be trained up fairly quickly. In some regards, I would say the same thing should be happening abroad. When we go abroad, you wouldn't want the military to just say, run and do this. I said what the military has is tremendous operational capacity, which at the low end tends to get to that just disciplined labor in a place where the United States needs it at a particular moment in time. And that's a key point, particularly when it comes to war. When you're in a violent environment, essentially the military is an organization actually designed to operate in a violent environment, to protect itself, to provide for itself in a very austere environment, and to do a variety of things, most importantly combat, but it can do other things. So if not needed for some of these higher priority things, when you get to the point of here are other national tasks that need to be done, whether you know, sort of more in the USAID or State Department realm, guidance from their, with their expertise to use the military and its assets to assist in accomplishing those tasks is really the way we've kind of operated through most of our history. So it's really the expertise resides with the civilians. So I would go back to say, yes, they have to have that expertise and be there to lead, but the military is going to participate, and oftentimes in ways that may distort what the military's capabilities are. Like I said, at the base level, it could be just disciplined labor. But the fact of the matter is the, uh, the military has engineer forces, it has logistics forces, it has communications assets, it has a lot of assets built for high-intensity combat. 
and with a lot of redundancy that can be used, is fungible for other things, assuming that higher priority task isn't there. So to me, it's going to be a combination of civil and military activity, which doesn't let the civilians off the hook right. or the military uh, from their role. OK, so first, I mean, I basically agree with that. But first, I'm not aware of any evidence that any of the things we've asked the military to do over Ebola or tsunami mm -hmm. relief have in any way seriously diminished readiness. You know, maybe there's evidence out there, but I'd, I'd like to see it. Secondly, you know, Richard's point is, is very important about, you know, the, the scale, the capabilities, the engineer, all that stuff. No other agency has it. No other agency could possibly have it because there's no need for it outside of an emergency setting. You know, you're not going to have a force of 10 or 15 or 20,000 civilians who spent their whole time rehearsing for an Ebola epidemic or something like that and who get used like once every two years. That's just not, it's not, simply not plausible. So I, and by the way, the idea that these are non-traditional tasks, that's nonsense. I mean, West Point was an engineering school. So, you know, you had mm. military engineers building roads, digging canals, building the White House. Building the building the capital. If you look at what we did after World War II in terms of military government, these are, you know, Richard was right. The military decided to write a lot of its real missions, including, by the way, I would argue, counterinsurgency, out of its playbook after the first Gulf War, and that did contribute to a crisis in civil military relations. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I really thought this was going too far, then I would say, you know, let's hang on. One further thing, though, I would I would. Uh, make a point of, and that is, you know, part of our thinking back on these wars, you know, part of the argument will be, should we have gone into Iraq? That's fine. Uh, we should have that argument. But there should also be a very careful analysis, I think, and a discussion of how did we fight those wars? And, you know, what did we do well and what did we do poorly? I would say there are a whole bunch of things we did very well, and there's a whole bunch of things we did really poorly. I think command and control, no question in my mind about it. And I think the military has to hold up a mirror to itself on some of those issues. You know, why were units not going back to the same patch, for example? Right. Why were they going to different parts of the theater? Sometimes to different theaters, rather than, say, the way the Marines did, continually going back to Anbar. But some of it should be about the amount of money that we spent on reconstruction. Was that all really helpful? Or was some of it, as I now strongly suspect, and in this respect I've changed my view, counterproductive. That is to say, when we go into these kinds of conflict zones, as we will, because the civilians will make the decisions and they'll make whatever decisions they make, um, you know, we may want to rethink whether you know, our contribution really can be rebuilding these societies the way we want to as soon as we get on, on, the, uh, on the ground. Or rather, is what we can do help provide security, help train up security forces, give some assistance in terms of training the locals, and then get out of the way and let them do it their way. And I, for me, that is actually one of the lessons of Afghanistan and, and Iraq. Very good. Um, before we go to the audience q and I want to get your all of your impressions, starting with Mark, on you know what right looks like. What, uh, Mark, what are your thoughts on going forward learning whatever lessons we have out of the past 13 years, but in, in the context of a history, a long history of U.S. civil-military relations, we have, as I said, a number of leaders coming out now um, into Congress, a number of uh, former service members, excuse me, coming out into Congress. We do have, actually, as Elliot pointed out, despite the 1%, we have many Americans, more than half of American families have someone who served in the military, um, there is a generation here that's new and different. What should they um, take forward as a thought on the military and the civilian side about how to make this constitutional system we have of civil military, uh, civil civilian control of the military work? Well, you notice what we're not talking about today. We're not talking about whether the Air Force, Navy, and the Army could actually work together to fight wars in combined arms. And that's because we passed the Goldwater-Nichols Act, and I think it's worked. Uh, and that's because policymakers in Washington recognized a problem and solved it. And there's no crisis in civil-military relations going forward, uh, but there are challenges, and we have to face them. We've expressed some of those 
challenges here. I think that while there isn't a crisis, the challenges really are important. And we can't look past them. And the, we're not going to go back to a draft. The military doesn't want to go back to a draft. We don't need a draft. We have the expertise in the military and the correct fighting force that we need, and they're very effective. Uh, but we have to determine as a nation, well, remember George Bush, remember President Bush said, well, I can tell Americans one thing, we're not going to be involved in nation building. Well, yeah, we are, because we can't live in a world of ungoverned spaces in Iraq and Syria. And somebody's going to have to do it, and we're the only economy in the world that can do it. So we have to apply the expertise to do that. That's the biggest challenge going forward. I don't think that it's the military's job to do it. And that means that we have to construct some kind of cadre of dedicated, I think State Department people have shown in Anbar and Iraq, real courage and dedication to going out there and doing it. I'm not degrading that at all, but we need more of those people, not fewer, and we need to draw the line between fighting wars and nation building. It's not the same thing, and it's two different kinds of expertise. We need to pay attention to that issue, I think, going forward. Rich, your views on what leaders coming out today ought to know yeah. for the future to, to run this American system well? Well, one, it, it is, it's a system that's designed for debate and conflict. And that's, I mean, that's the way our founders had it, and that's one of our greatest strengths. I mean, when you look at, at when I was thinking about civil military relations, uh, you, you mentioned before, and I was thinking about some of the crises, individual crises over time, there's a part of me thought, well, okay, well, which system in the world would I want that's better? And so, you know, so the, so one of those, the Churchill quote pops to mind of, you know, it's, a, it's, the, it's the worst of all possible systems except for all the others. I, I, think it's, I think it's very healthy, and I think but there's a key element to making a system that thrives on debate and tension work like that, and that is, from both sides, a sense of candor and humility uh, from the military to be forthright about what it knows to be its professional expertise, convey to civilian leaders, and there's a variety of ways we talk about the forums, you know, whether behind closed doors, with testimony, but to be candid about their professional military judgment and know when they are exercising judgment based on their military expertise, not kind of holding forth as an American citizen might around the water cooler based on what they read in the paper that morning. So be mindful of what their true expertise is. Be candid about it. And the part about the water cooler, I'd say that's the humility part. Recognize what they don't know. And this is true on both sides. No human being kind of has the market cornered on all this wisdom. Our system is built to take advantage of collective wisdom. To do that well is to have respect on both sides for what the expertise each brings to bear. Be candid when they see those, you know, where that expertise should be brought to bear. But be humble about who gets to decide and what, whether you could be right or wrong. And this is where, on both sides, insistence, but ultimately our system resolves in favor of the civilians. The civilians get to decide. And, but I, and so if I spend more time with the military folks who probably have a more defined body of expertise that they feel strongly about, you know, also emphasizing, but ultimately when push comes to shove and there's a difference in judgment, the civilians decide and be humble about the factors they're bringing to bear that you are not considering. That is why our system was built the way it was in the first place, by very, very wise founders. So Great. Uh, that's why I think. Elliot, you thought? Uh, I guess um, well, I'd say a couple of things. So I think the, the basic principles are, first, absolutely right. There's going to be tension. It's designed for that. And it's inevitable you know, because of what the military is and what politicians are like. Um, I would say, secondly, vigorous discussion and debate inside, and it's largely the job of the civilian leadership to elicit that uh, and to probe and to question and for military people to be forthright. I would say discipline when it comes to how that is then presented to the outside world. I mean, there's congressional testimony is, is a separate issue because the military's, our system was set up for conflict in that way. But, but I don't think senior military officers should be holding forth about what they think American foreign policy should be. And at the end of the day, we have to confront the fact the civilians have the right to be wrong. You know, it is the, you know, the bedrock of this is civilian authority. And, you know, and our military basically lives up to that. I, I think my emphasis is a little bit different in one sense. You know, my view of where we are internationally is we're, we're entering into what I believe is an extremely dangerous period uh, where whether you look at 
the spread of Islamist movements in throughout the Middle East, North Africa, and other places. You look at a very assertive China in uh, East Asia. You look at what we're seeing in Europe, which is the dismemberment of a sovereign state whose borders were guaranteed. This being done by violence, you know, since the first time since World War II, there's a period of tremendous challenges. This is not a good time f for senior military leaders to be kind of laying down the law about which wars they think they should fight and they shouldn't fight, or to say in public how they think they should fight them. You know, what, what will give any administration, this administration, or Bush administration, or any administration in the future, that the right, you know, one of the right cards to play in the game of international poker is the sense that behind them is an extremely effective and highly disciplined military which will do whatever it's lawfully ordered to do. Great. All right, let's go to audience questions. We have microphones, um, so when it comes to you, please give me uh, give us your name and your affiliation. So why don't we start with Charlie right here? Uh, Charlie Stevenson. I'm at SAIS. Uh, I have a question about the Congress, the alternate source of civilian control in our system. And after listening to Secretary Work talk about all of the congressional no's on administration plans, and, you know, I have a sense. Congress is in thrall to MOA and doesn't want to make any change in military benefits uh, because that somehow dishonors the military. My question is, what do you think the military role is in these issues of military pay and benefits, readiness, modernization, trade-offs, and so forth? The military's role in? Is it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thoughts on the military's role in terms of maybe that's rich, you might be positioned for that in, in um, presenting the case mm -hmm. to Congress. Well, and, and I did mention, you know, in terms of, yes, we have divided principles in the United States in terms of who we answer to the executive branch and of Congress, of course. And so, but I've mentioned just in passing in terms of senior leaders dealing with them. But particularly right now, and this is, we're kind of in an ambiguous era. In wartime, it tends to be a little more focused on, you know, how are we operating to, to accomplish policy aims in the midst of war. We're kind of turning towards the how should the force be shaped for the future. So a lot more about investments for the, for the future. If there's kind of a, a little bit of a, a tip in the balance between when you're fighting wars, it's about the immediate needs. What do we do right now to succeed at these policy aims? First, we're thinking more about the future. What's kind of the investment or insurance policy you need for, for future threats? We're dealing with both. Uh, what do what the deputy secretary I think was talking about were some of the investment points looking more toward the future what do we how do we how do we address those issues and there military personnel costs as you know, are going up as a percentage even with the same number of folks where they are much more costly uh, per person and the idea of there have been proposals from the Department of Defense you know about how to rein those in uh, and I think they've made those cases I won't so I'm not going to substitute you know any details for what the the chiefs of service and all have put out. But it's a tough one when you're dealing with the constituencies, and you're right, the, the different uh, veterans communities that are out there that are very powerful and have a very strong interest in that. Uh, and that's, again, they, they will have their voice, but that, I think, right, right now, the point is to say, all right, when you look to these investments, be mindful of the priority, the choices you're making. Uh, the choice of continuing on the same path we are in terms of benefits and pay and the personnel costs, means a decrement to other investments that you might make if we're constrained by a top line of the defense budget and saying that those are inherently political choices that Congress is going to have to weigh in on. We can't simplify that for Congress. So the military isn't going to simplify them. But they're laying those choices out. And I think they're doing it appropriately to say, here are the trade-offs you're making in terms of operational capacity, modernization, and personnel costs. And just like the society as a whole, we know that there's sort of this growing incremental cost of human capital and just for social services that we've committed to that may need to change. If, you know, the, um, it seems to be one of the problems that we now have is actually the aftermath of a different civil-military relations crisis, and that was the way we treated veterans after Vietnam. And, you know, there was such a, there has been such a revulsion against that, appropriately so, that the norm is now really to just go completely nuts in terms of benefits for veterans. By the way, I'm the father of a veteran. And it's ridiculous, and it's going to cripple the defense budget. Now, I think military people can sort of lay that out, but it is ultimately the job of the politi 
political leadership, both in Congress and in the executive branch, to be very forthright about that. Because what's going to happen is the, the amount of money that we now put into veterans benefits, some of which is just ludicrous, uh, is you know, really going to cripple our ability to function internationally. Let's come over here. Just wait for the mic. Hi, Steve Benson, CSIS. Uh, if we go to Rich's comment, uh, he mentioned uh, uh, unity of command. And then later on, you mentioned debate in conflict. So there's this, there's this tension that goes on there. But I'd like to ask the three panelists. In 2007, when the surge was in, in, in its force, uh, the business task, I was on the business task force over there. Um, and there was success was occurring, and General Petraeus and Ryan Crocker were there. Could you tell me, each three, the three of you, who you thought was in charge in theater, not here, but who had the final call in theater for U.S. force, for U.S. effort during the surge in 2007? Who was, who was the person? You know, I spent a lot of time over there in 2007, so I'll give you, let me first say something about the surge. The guy who was in charge was George W. Bush. Um, and his, the surge decision is, an, is itself a very interesting study in civil military relations because he was overruling almost all of his senior military advisors, getting advice in some indirect ways, which nobody liked, and it was the right decision. And it's, uh, you know, I, whatever else you think about George W. Bush, and I understand the people who are critical of him, it was a very, it was a brave uh, move and the move that you'd want a commander in chief to be willing to execute. My feeling whenever I went over Iraq, it was pretty clear that what you had was a kind of unequal uh, dual leadership, Dave Petraeus and Ryan Crocker, mm -hmm. uh, with Petraeus, you know, because he had all the resources really. Uh, playing the dominant role, but I think I always felt that Petraeus was very, very careful, and I think Ryan Crocker would would agree in uh, showing respect for the role of the ambassador. I thought it was brilliant that their offices were about as far apart as those two walls. Uh, that you know Petraeus would never see Prime Minister Maliki without uh, Crocker with him. It was it's you know it, at a diff different kind of level. I thought it was a model civil military relationship. Now, further down, you know, were the munchkins all fighting each other? Of course the munchkins were all fighting each other. That's what people in bureaucracies do. But, but I think you did have a kind of uni unity of, what was in effect a unity of command with kind of two heads at the top with one head being very careful and restrained but actually being in charge, and that was Petraeus. was interesting on... Um during the second Gulf War that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Myers, criticized um, sniping uh, among the retired types, as he, I think, called them. He was referring to General McCaffrey's appearance on CNN at the time, saying we didn't have the force necessary. And Shinseki was right. And Myers said it was sniping. And then Mullen, General, uh, Admiral Mullen, beg your pardon, the chairman, I think, took real umbrage when Jack Keane argued for the surge and called it sniping. We, we need more of that sniping. I agree that I thought that the, you know, Jack Keane was right to confront Admiral Mullins, I understand, happened and said, you know, we have to get this right. We can't lose this. Your job to get this right. Let's get this right. You should be with me on this. And this kind of interplay between the retired military and the currently serving military, I think, is important. It's informed decisions well in the past. I hope it continues in the future. I think it's, it's going on right now. We've had Tony Zinni last week talking about why General Allen was appointed in special emissary. I, you know, people say, oh, things are in chaos. I actually think it's, it's a sign of real maturity when that kind of debate can go on among retired and currently serving military types. Okay, right over here. I'm Will Embry. Uh, I work at DynCorp International now, a former Foreign Service officer. After the uh, invasion of Iraq, and it's clear that we didn't have a uh, strategy uh, in place for post-conflict uh, security, uh, reconstruction, uh, stability, uh, the think tank community, everybody came, tried to figure out how we should have done it. 
Uh, there was sort of a general conclusion that probably state should do it. Our friends on the Hill uh, in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and state put together a working group, and they came up with this brilliant idea of SCRS, the uh, 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 Civilian Reconstru uh, Reconstruction and Stability, which didn't work. Uh, and the states now tried to reform that into CSO, which also didn't work. As I look back on this, since I was part of the task force that put this together, it's clear that DOD is a preparedness organization. When they're not fighting, they're ready to fight. State is an operational organization. Everybody in state is working at a job, and our appropriators have never been willing to provide us with anybody on a contingency basis. And as Elliot said, state's never going to have the resources to actually take on that role. So it's got to be a, a surge capability. Military has got it in, in uh, the civil affairs folks who are in the Guard and Reserve. Mm -hmm. You got any thoughts? You know, I let, you, know you said you were going to bring this up. I'll bring mm -hmm. it up for you. you know, what are your thoughts about where this should go in the future? Well, yeah, all three of you, and I know Mark specifically mentioned the Civilian Reserve Corps, but I'll, why don't we start with Elliot since he lived personally through the joy of that um, period. Well, the first thing is I, I really, you know, what the State Department can do, well, first I would just remind everybody, there's like 7,500 Foreign Service officers, so for you military types, that's two understrength infantry brigades deployed to, if I remember correctly, 267 squad to company-sized outposts around the world. You do the arithmetic. Mm -hmm. it, one thing it means is the State Department is always running hot. The, you know, whereas defense has a 10 to 15 percent personnel float for education and training, there is no float in the State Department, and there can't be. But I think it goes, it goes deeper than that. Um, I actually came away with a, a lot of admiration and, it, God help me, affection for the State Department. Uh, after spending a couple of years there, having had a lot of experience in defense, but none in state. But, but I, I came away thinking the culture, it's not just the size and the scale, the culture is not the right culture. The culture, let me be very clear, I knew lots of and know lots of heroic, brave, utterly selfless and patriotic diplomats. That's not the issue. But in the State Department, when you say plan something, what you mean is give me a checklist of you know, items that you want to accomplish over the next week. In the military, it's troops to task. You know, what's the mission? What are the resources we're going to need? What are the different stages? You know, it's, people are used to, to moving stuff around. The Defense Department, although I knew some wonderful leaders in the State Department, somebody like recently retired Deputy Secretary of State, Bill Burns, to take just one example, and there are loads of others. Uh, still, it is not a leadership-driven organization, whereas the military, when you start off as a cadet in ROTC, you know, they're pounding into you, my mission, my people, myself, all the basics of leading under stress. That's not what the State Department does, and it's not part of the culture. It's not gonna be part of the culture. All this being so, I would say let's be very open about this. If we're going to do these things, these will be military-driven functions if, if you're dealing with combat zones. You might want to build out other parts of the National Guard or Reserve. I think that makes perfect sense. But it's best to have those people in uniform. It's best to have them able to carry firearms and know how to use them if you're dealing with a conflict zone, which... You know, there's an allergy, it's really amazing to me, there's an allergy in the State Department to having diplomats carry weapons. I don't know why, but, but there is. Um, but that's not what you want in a conflict zone. You do want somebody who's willing to pack heat because they may need it. So put all that stuff into the Guard and Reserves if that's what you want to do. And, and let the State Department play that critical role of political advice because that's what they're good at reading foreign cultures, advising on that, sort of interpreting that, but, but don't put tasks that in the nature of things they will never be able to do. It's my job as a panelist to give you solutions. I don't have a clue what to do about this. Um, but I know that Secretary Gates and Condoleezza Rice talked about this a lot, um, about the role of the military and the State Department in post-conflict areas and how to straighten it out and what it meant to be a Title VIII versus a Title 22, and where the law was and who was gonna handle it. 
And Rumsfeld never talked to Condoleezza Rice, let's be blunt about this, because he, while he was waging war in Iraq, he was also waging war against her, so they never talked about it. Thank God we had Bob Gates come in and talk about it. But I think it needs to be straightened out. Maybe it is the job of the Guard and the Reserve. Fine, then change the law. But get, you know, maybe we ought to start with Gates and Condoleezza Rice and have this discussion. What are we going to do about this? And um, I don't know what to do about it. I think it's good, good advice because the Guard and the Reserve did it in Anbar. They did a terrific job with the help of the State Department. Fine. But that's not what the law says. The law says something really quite different. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a problem. And people on Capitol Hill are very uneasy about it. And what are we going to do about it? Let's face it and come up with a solution. Rich, you were in the trenches on this, this yeah. issue. Well, just a couple of things. First off, going so I was in the Pentagon, and our, our main counterpart office was the, the uh, SCRS, the State Department Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization, as we were working on trying to figure out what the right sort of policy uh, division was. But they also were trying to build some operational capacity. I worked with them a lot, both in Washington and then when I was in Afghanistan, but those some of the, the SCRS folks trying to operate. And... In terms of getting the expertise and working with at sort of the embassy level to sort of work country plans and the things that the State Department is responsible for and USAID with regard to programs, there was an important benefit that I think that SCRS, and I hope that CSO, and I know they're still there, and I haven't been as in close touch with them of late, are continuing to work on how we get the right policies and authorities to connect the sorts of things that the, the, the State Department and USAID do well and which are needed in a peculiar way in, in, in conflict zones that the military has to be more mindful of and participate in doing that. So that idea that we need to stay, we learned that we were uh, detached in ways we shouldn't have been, I think, uh, early in, in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. I think we've done well to improve how we're linked with them at the policy level. And then when it comes to the operational level, I think that's where there's still a, a difference in expectation, particularly by the military folks, that they will come in and simply substitute for the military as opposed to provide better expert, you know, more expertise and policy guidance in the realms that they are good at, the cultural knowledge, uh, the use of the authorities that only the State Department has. And we're doing a better job of that. So th then I'll add another part. Then on the military side, we're looking at how, you know, there's ways to look at that too. Civil affairs... Um, historically, in World War II, there were civil affairs units and there were military government units. Civil affairs kind of went into the areas we liberated and worked with the local authorities who were friends and could... So there was kind of an assumption there was a structure there they could sort of help be liaison between the U.S. military and locals that we were working with. That, and that's really the dominant role that civil affairs had played in most of the post-World War II era, after, or after the occupation of Germany and Japan. Well, we kind of lost that part. So when civil affairs showed up in Iraq and Afghanistan, oftentimes they were ready to liaise with somebody, but there was nobody there. Now, mm -hmm. Unlike Kosovo or Bosnia, mm -hmm. we had displaced the local governance structure, and we were, at least at we, at we, you know, the UN resolution says, we were the occupying power, and we were responsible for governance. But we didn't have that military government capacity yeah. we had had that we developed during World War II. Well, we're looking to sort of reestablish some of that at, yep. at the Special Operations Center for the Army. And again, that's, I, I can't give you details on that. I just am aware that they're, they're, they're working on it. That's where I would say, again, it's sort of we identified a major disconnect uh, in terms of both uh, the civilian and appropriate civilian and military folks working together. I think both sides are working. What would be a tragedy to me is this is one of those areas where we've struggled through trying to find a good way forward over the last 13 years. And if in the budget cuts, these sort of new... Uh, developments are the first to go, I think that would be a significant tragedy. In other words, we learn this mission set and, the and, and better ways to do this at, at some cost, uh, both lives, treasure, and in terms of mission success, that we shouldn't have to face again. In other words, the military, the Army in particular, not doing counterinsurgency, that should never leave the portfolio. That can't leave the portfolio. The same thing should be true with the insights gained from SCRS, and civil affairs and, and what we saw about military governance. So I think that's another one we need to, to lock in as best we can. Okay, let's just take a few more questions. Um, let's go right here. Thank you very much for this very engaging uh, panel. Um, you know, I served in Iraq, and I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, Sometimes is, is the nature of, of uh, uh, policy as who is going to take the lead in that cir uh, certain circumstances sometimes confuse the people on the ground. I mean, sometimes when I remember we, when I'm a medical officer and I was stationed with the Office of Security Cooperation and medical issues are medical issues. You get them with the Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Health, and they used to come to me because 
And sometimes it's very hard to help my counterpart in Iraq because I don't have the authority to engage. So sometimes uh, maybe the directive when we get people on the ground to do this is sometimes it's confusing. I'm curious to see is what, what, what you gentlemen think about, about when you uh, assign a mission to someone, is the nature of the mission sometimes create the confusion that, that, that take place on the ground? Let's group one more question with this. Um, let's have one way back here. Yes, good morning. My name is Paul Tennant. I'm an uh, exchange officer, British exchange officer in the Pentagon. I've been here for a couple of years now. I'd just like to um, run a couple of observations past you and ask if you agree, and if you do, whether there are any uh, feasible solutions. The first one I, I would say from the outset is very much um, uh, common to the UK equivalent, which is that there is an issue, in my opinion, with the routine physical access between those who work in the State Department and those who work in the DOD. And I don't understand why we can't all just have a pass which gets us into both and allows us to talk to each other from a much younger age and then throughout our careers. Uh, the second observation is, uh, is that it, it seems to me to be very difficult to persuade uh, lawmakers to make decisions based on the best federal interests if they're dealing with federal institutions, uh, wherever possible divorced from the state interests which uh, often uh, drive their votes. Um, and I wondered if there's any solution that you can see to encouraging people to vote uh, for what's best for the federal institution. <laughs> okay, so I think the first is the question is really related back to this issue of unity of command, direction, and actually authorities, which is something, because we've talked about reconstruction, we sort of danced around, but there are very you know, distinct authorities going on here, both in terms of the military system and chain of command, but also related to um, the Title 22 versus Title 10, as Mark pointed out. So that's the first set Title of issues. Title 10, sorry. Yeah, sorry. The, 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 that's the first the set of issues. The second is, uh, I guess I would say, sort of the, maybe the tribal nature, uh, back to the issue of the tribal nature of the different cultures inside the, the national security system that makes civil-military relations as frustrating, I guess one would say, on both sides as they are. Are there ways to take on those cultural issues? And if you wish to take on this question of how to make uh, members of Congress vote uh, for the national interests versus state interests, I welcome you to do that with the acknowledgment that Senator Warner is in the front row and can judge your answer accordingly. So go ahead, Mark. I'm not going to take on your question because I don't know really what you're talking about. It's just not. Well, I'll, but I'll answer this one, if I may very quickly and then allow my colleagues to come. Um, in, in Anbar during the surge, General Casey gave, pre, little pre-surge, General Casey gave General Conway of the Marine Corps a mandate to solve the problem in Anbar, which included getting 18 to 35 year olds to work and Conway went down to the Third Civil Affairs Group to Colonel John Coleman and said, get it done. And um, and so Coleman met with what Rumsfeld had called terrorists, and when he met with them the next day, they became insurgents. <laughs> and that well, was okay because then they were insurgents because we met with them. They used to be terrorists, and he and he and he met with them in Amman, and they and they started building out the very earliest days of the surge and. In talking to the, these guys, Coleman and Walker, and these guys who did this out in Anbar, they, I said, who, who did you answer to? Who gave you permission to do this? What was your mandate? And he said, I was told to do it. I did it until somebody told me you can't do that. Nobody said, don't do that. So I did it. Now, that seems to me to be pretty much the way the US military appropriately runs itself. They get a mandate. They have an order. They follow it, they do it until somebody says, wait a second, which case he did. He said, Conway, you're running a goat rope out there. And Conway came back and said, you told me to solve this problem. Here were the parameters, and that's what I'm doing, and it's being solved, sir. <laughs> and he said, okay, you're right. And so, you know, this is, yeah, I understand, you know, this kind of lines of communication, all this, but that's the nature of conflict, and we were in a conflict in Iraq, and we worked our way through it, and the surge worked. Um, so, uh, just the 
to the issue of access badges, I remember the first time I went to work in the Pentagon, uh, I was in the office of the Secretary of Defense. I could not get into the joint staff spaces. So we had, a, we had an issue within the Pentagon. I don't know if they've sorted no, that out. No, they haven't sorted that out. What? No, they restrict access. Right. So, yeah. you know, so that, that gives you a sense of uh, how problematic things are. Look, I think what actually tends to happen is, in the way that Mark was just describing, on the ground, people tend to sort stuff out. And so a lot of the, um, you know, the pushing and pulling tends to happen. There tends to be a lot of it here. That, you know, there'd be a lesser amount in Baghdad, and then, you know, out in the field, people kind of work things out, and it's very largely personality-driven. Um, Speaking of personality driven, one thing I would say is it is the nature of these kinds of conflicts that they are you know, so extraordinarily complex. It requires a different skill set than most generals have. What, one of the mistakes that I think a lot of our political leaders make and even some of our military leaders make is to think, well, you know, generals are interchangeable. Generals are not interchangeable. There are some who you want you know, to fight the big one in Europe with the Russians. Uh, and there are others who you want to be, you know, some kind of proconsul in Afghanistan. And, and, they're, and they are different kinds of human beings with different abilities. And that's one of the challenges, I think, for civilian leadership is figuring out which one you've got. And the final thing I'll say is, uh, I mean, I, that, that, that is a great story, and it's a true story, um, about the surge. One thing I'd remind us all as we talk about these wars uh, I once had the opportunity to sit, actually I had several opportunities to sit down with Anbari Sheikhs. The Anbaris have a different view of what the awakening was. They actually think they did it, <laughs> not that we did it. And that's an important point as we you know, think through these wars. We are not the only actors. You know, we sometimes talk about these things as if it's all a question of, you know, do we do the right thing, do we do the wrong thing, how do we do it? And we sort of assume that there's some bad guys out there who are just kind of an implacable force, which one way or another you're going to take apart. And everybody else, you know, is acted upon rather than acting. And that's just not true. So they're, very good they're, point. they're acting as well. Very good point. Very good point. I agree. Yeah. Rich, just add, the last uh, word. Oh, thanks. And I'll just, uh, well, you know, I go back to where I started in terms of, you know, the nature of military relations. I, I, I was reminded, looking back through some of my notes about, you know, what had happened uh, early in the Cold War, and if you look at the tension, I mean, what Taylor going public with his views against President Eisenhower, against his views of the new look, which was the more the massive retaliation and pushing for flexible response, and some of the tensions going on as we were thinking about what was what was supposed to happen in the future, and then some of the things we saw in Vietnam. I was reminded, you know, people go back to so where's the good model? Well, you know, Marshall with Roosevelt uh, seems to be a pretty good one, and there's a lot of interesting details to that. But there's a key point that I would highlight about that era. When you're fighting a war of unlimited aims, the military's natural tendency and the, and the government of the people's desire to support them in providing whatever is necessary to win at that moment tends to line up with the military's preferences. So there's not that much civil military tension when you're in sort of total war for unlimited aims. We haven't been in that circumstance uh, for the, since the World War II. What we've seen over the last 13 years are Wars for limited policy aim, or generally limited aim. Some we've displaced some governments, but certainly partial means. And so a lot of times this tension between how much force to use and how to use it, sort of the natural tendencies that the military leaders are going to have you know, towards escalation. It's very Clausewitzian. You know, once you get going, you want to win and push as hard as you can. Greats against the civilians saying, or the civilians' preference to restrain the use of force to keep it in line with the policy aims that we're pursuing and the resources we have available. In that context, I looked at the last 13 years and said, you know, we did pretty well compared to other times, Vietnam and the post-Korean War, or the Korean War itself, yep. and then the post-Korean War, how we adjusted to the nuclear era and new services. And we've got more services. We now have an Air Force. We now have a Department of Defense. We have more players. By the way, access-wise, I was also reminded that we fixed the access thing previously. The War Navy State Building was where the War Department, the State Department, and the Navy Department, that is now the old executive office building, that is the seat of the National Security Council. Everybody else kind of had to move out because they got too big, and so we sort of separated. So there was a time, but it was an easier time, and we didn't have quite the same challenges or the establishment. So we're not going to solve that exit problem, I don't think, easily. What we've done is recognize these are complex issues. We've grown the number of organizations involved. 
And these are all valuable voices. I would not argue in favor of unification, as other nations have done. In fact, the different service voices, the State Department voice, the USAID voice are all valuable voices to add to the debate. And so in that regard, the proliferation of organizations and some of the inefficiencies that come with that are nonetheless sort of the signs of health or are, are part of what makes our system work well. And in that regard, I look and say, no, we haven't seen a lot of harmony, but harmony would be bad, but it's been healthy in terms of, I think, generating, talk about the right issues, debate about the right issues, and resolution pretty well. And then, don't get me wrong, there's policy issues we could have done better at, and there's things we need to take forward. So this is not that, you know, there, we certainly haven't solved all the problems out there, but civil-military relations-wise, I think it's been fairly healthy, and we've got a lot of positive things that we can learn from how things have happened over the last 13 years. And my greater concern is that we'll put those lessons aside when we mm -hmm. go back to our corners organizationally to deal with more bureaucratic battles that are less important than maybe some of the national policy aims we've had to work with uh, downrange over the last few years. Well, I want to thank all the panelists this morning. I, I just quickly jotted my takeaways. Um, we don't have a crisis in civil military relations. There's tension that's healthy and unavoidable and intended by the system. Um, <coughs> that we have a lot of work to do on whole of government efforts still to understand the various roles and responsibilities that different agencies, including the military, bring, and in particular on this issue set of reconstruction, which we have not solved. And I very much fear, as Rich has indicated, he fears that we're going to lose those lessons. And perhaps most importantly is Elliot's reminder that working in government is very frustrating. <laughs> so um, for all of those of you who are away from government today, uh, hopefully you are a little less frustrated for the event. And please join me in thanking this panel. Nice meeting you. And we're going to have a break. The next session starts up here at 11 AM. <laughs>